Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. When Phil Sanderson presented the Naked Scientist episode called Where Did COVID Come From? This is how he opened the show. The story that we've been told is that the coronavirus came from bats and jumped into humans sometime late last year at a seafood market in the city of Wuhan, China. It's a neat tale, but the problem is nobody actually knows whether it's true and the evidence is mixed, which is why the World Health Organization said, Over the past few months, there has been a lot of discussion about the origins of COVID-19. All preparations have been finalized and WHO experts will be traveling to China this weekend to prepare scientific plans with their Chinese counterparts for identifying the zoonotic sources of their disease. The question I'm tempted to ask is whether Tedros Ghebreyesus was jumping the gun when he limited the terms of the World Health Organization inquiry to the zoonotic sources of the disease, that is, being passed from animal to human. The Wuhan lab leak theory is the subject of this week's Naked Reflections. It may have been promoted by Donald Trump and soon became a contender for conspiracy theory of the year, but over recent months it seems to have gained some traction. Not least because when the World Health Organization reported their findings, they acknowledged they were limited by the Chinese authorities in accessing all the relevant data. With me to discuss this intriguing and perhaps unresolvable mystery are two well-qualified guests. The medical anthropologist, Dr. Freya Jeffcott, a friend of Naked Reflections and who spent time in her youth catching and testing bats. And joining Freya is Dr. Alfred Moore, a lecturer in political theory at the University of York. Alfred's work includes a focus on the generation of conspiracy theories and why people believe in them. I think Alfred must be a very busy man. Freya, Tedros Ghebreyesus referred to the zoonotic sources of the disease. Is the lab leak theory or theories discounted altogether? I think that's the point. There's a few different lab leak theories. And the one that initially got traction, the idea that the coronavirus was engineered in the lab, so it would be sort of transmissible um, through human populations. I think that's been well and truly put to bed. Tell us a little bit about the origins of where some of these theories came from, Freya. If I'm not mistaken, I think this idea that it was sort of engineered in a lab was maybe at least made popular by Professor David Baltimore, an American Nobel laureate. He claimed that you wouldn't see that sequence for creating this particular amino acid in viruses. It's only found in humans. And he said, this is the smoking gun that it's been engineered. But then, you know, some very prominent virologists were quite quick in saying, actually, no, that's not the case. Not only do we see this in viruses, actually, in a lot of coronaviruses, we see this, including the 2002 SARS epidemic. And at that point, David Baltimore sort of backtracked and he was like, I was just saying we need to be open to the possibility that it's, you know, been engineered. But obviously, that's very different from a smoking gun. And once you say these things, you really can't take it out of sort of public domain in that way. It's one of the funny things, I guess, about conspiracy theory is that it takes a kind of attitude of suspicion and doubt that in many contexts we take to be quite valuable, pushes it to a you know, more radical extreme. I suppose what goes wrong with it is how it's embedded in a process of inquiry, right? because we don't call someone a conspiracy theorist the first moment they raise the prospect as someone like David Baltimore did, right? That isn't what we do. But it perhaps demonstrated that, you know, this was not the case or didn't have biological plausibility or something. And, you know, then you'd say he's on the road to being a conspiracy theorist. And then if if he started, say, imagining ways in which he could rescue his claim from all of these refutations by inventing more and more machinations that kind of explain away. So when people are chased by refutations and then sort of find themselves inventing other things, then you might say, well, then they're going right down the rabbit hole. The lab leak theory that seems to have been kicking on is this idea that it's a natural virus, but via the sort of research activities of this lab in Wuhan, sort of catching bats or working with the viruses, someone got infected and that's how it got into the wider population. And unfortunately, that's a much harder sort of theory to put to rest. 
Are there precedents for this sort of lab leak theory? Absolutely. So there was this idea that HIV was a virus engineered in a lab. Um, Lyme disease, which was the initial cases were detected on a place called Plum Island, which happened to have an American veterinary research facility. And so that was meant to be a sort of engineered lab leak. Ebola, uh, SARS in 2002, again, very similar theories about it emerging from a lab, though we eventually worked out the definitive chain of events. But uh, I mean, lab leaks do happen, like not engineered viruses, certainly not that, but sort of, you know, a needle stick injury or someone handles an infected animal and gets bitten. They're not uncommon. They do happen. Uh, There's been a few sort of more high profile ones in recent years. So a few years back in the Netherlands, a couple of polio cases got out of a polio vaccine factory. In 2004 in Beijing, we had the 2002 SARS virus get out and infect a few people from a lab leak. The UK famously gave us our last smallpox case back in the 60s or 70s from a lab leak. And I mean, Marburg's been in the news recently. And in, I think, the 1970s in Germany, they ended up with 32 cases of Marburg after a lab leak accident. So, I mean, actual lab leaks do happen, though they tend to be quite small and contained. But lab leak theories come up with every big sort of epidemic anyway. Since the opening up of East Germany in the 1990s, archival papers were discovered showing that the KGB had actually planted the AIDS HIV lab leak story, the idea that it had been leaked from a lab in Maryland. That was part of a KGB disinformation campaign and a very successful one because that that claim is still circulating today. Do you have a view yourself about what happened? I have a sense that probably what happened is the most obvious thing, that through some sort of chain of events, we had a virus from a bat population, potentially via some intermediate animal, and then that just happened to get into humans. I'm not convinced the lab was involved. So Alfred, does the lab leak story have symptoms of a classic conspiracy theory? In its form, I'd say yes and no, but it depends on what we take conspiracy to mean, right? So one classic form is the sort of secret rulers of the world model, right? Where the protocols of the elders of Zion, for example, is the most emblematic and influential example of a sort of a kind of conspiracy theory that imagines a forward-looking plan concocted and carried out by a secret group with a kind of global and world historical scope. So that's the classic form of conspiracy. I'm not sure that's what's at stake here. But probably the most common form of conspiracy least, is a cover-up, right? which is not a plan to control the direction of world history, but to cover up some cock-up or mistake. So take Watergate. Okay, there was a criminal act of small-scale cheating at its root, but the bulk of the investigation was into a conspiracy about the cover-up. So how should the World Health Organization take its investigation forward if there is this cover-up? I think it really depends on whether there is any kind of cover up or not, or to what degree there is a cover up. I think that the most important thing is to sort of crack on with the research that's already going on in sampling lots of animal species. I think that the only thing that could really put this conspiracy theory to bed is if they find good evidence of a plausible alternative route, which they may or they may not do. I mean, We've never managed it for Ebola in West Africa. We've never found the virus in an animal there, despite the large pandemic. And for SARS in 2002, it took us 14 years to find the right sort of animal chain of events. So, I mean, they're going to be working against people wanting impossible timelines on answers for this. And they need to really work hard not to undermine the sort of diplomatic relations that are needed for this collaborative research, which unfortunately this conspiracy theory really sort of chips away at. Is the scientific community in the US or in the West and in China a little bit too cosy? No, absolutely not. I think that's one of the wonderful things about uh, infectious disease research, even with the Iron Curtain. I think it was the Sabin polio vaccine. That was because of collaborative work that took place from Russian scientists or Soviet scientists and American scientists at the time. Um, I, I actually think this is one of our great protections against emerging infectious diseases is these days, because we do have so much ongoing collaboration by postdocs and PIs and such, that we have this network of researchers working together that transcends political divides. And we certainly saw that 
with the Wuhan lab and lots of Chinese research institutes with this pandemic. Alfred, it's interesting with Ebola, uh, which you just mentioned, we didn't get hung up on in the West about conspiracy theories. Freya's looking at maybe maybe we did, but I don't remember that. Whereas with the Wuhan leak conspiracy theory in quotation marks, there's been this massive amount of attention. Is why, why do you think that is? Is that simply technology awareness, or am I mistaken? One potential feature of COVID that's not shared by Ebola is the sheer impact that it's had on day to day life and lifestyles throughout the world. And it's led to enormous kinds of social and economic and personal sacrifice in all sorts of ways. So if you think of the sort of just the state of this have heightened the kind of emotional intensity, and particularly in Western nations, right? This has affected Western nations far more than Ebola ever did. So the global nature of it, I mean, I'm thinking of the plague and earlier pandemics, which also were surrounded by conspiracy theories, weren't they, Alfred? One way to think about this is that Global pandemics in the past have been associated with reordering of power relations. I mean, they have led to and been involved in major transformations, both in people's ordinary life and obviously life and death. But putting aside even life and death, they've led to great economic changes and shifts and the destruction of wealth, the creation of new winners and losers in a society. And that kind of shift is something that often then calls for some explanation or calls for some sense to be made of it. But I just think um, that the kind of large scale transformations that have taken place, you know, in the wake of pandemics are the sorts of things that people want to make sense of in some way, right? They want to give meaning to them. And one particular way they might do that is by trying to think about their origins or to think in those terms. Our recognition of the spread of HIV back in the 1980s and 1990s. So it came to light mostly in homosexual men in the US. And at the time, uh, a lot of like battles had been won in trying to establish the rights of homosexual men and women. And there've been all these great gains socially. And then suddenly there is this idea that there is a virus spreading and it only kills homosexuals. And it's being used by a lot of the state public health authorities to invade sort of homosexual men's lives, find out about their sexual histories, isolate them, all the rest. And I think then there was this sense of potentially conspiracy theories around it, because it did seem like it was a pushback against these kind of social and political gains. There's nothing natural about the way we respond to them, in a sense, and that the choices that are made and the values that are involved in judgments about what we do are sort of open, and that we can see, and that activists in the 1980s did clearly see that this was being used as well in an advantageous way by people who were already opposed to their rights and and to their freedom to live their lives. And so there was a certain kind of justifiable suspicion around what was being done with that. You had also in that the contribution of traditional religion, certainly in the States with some of the evangelical churches who condemn homosexuality and used it or saw it as some kind of judgment. Um, And that fed into the sort of hype and the conspiracy. I wonder, Freya, particularly with Ebola, because I know that you spent some time on that yourself, whether faith communities, faith leaders, community leaders made a difference in terms of managing the disease on the ground. Oh, absolutely. I can't imagine how you would tackle, uh, say, Ebola in Sierra Leone without also bringing on board imams quite early and also some spiritual leaders, or going with some of the Catholic church members in the DRC. I I think that's really important to give people a sort of a framework of what's happening that works for them and speaks to them and also can be reconciled with the biomedical interventions that we're proposing. Because I think if you end up potentially isolating that perspective or trying to separate it, then it can go to pieces very, very quickly. I think you're right, because I think that interaction between community leaders, faith leaders, the scientists and the politicians, it has to work together if one of them falls. And I wonder, Alfred, from a political theory point of view, if one of those constituencies falls down, then it can more easily lead into cover up debate, argument and some kind of conspiracy theory, uh, some kind of allegation against the other, whoever the other is. That's an interesting point, because I I think one of the particular kind of political problems or features of politics that sometimes creates 
pressure in this area is simply the partisan or adversarial nature of democratic politics, where there is a strong incentive, particularly in Anglo-American two-party politics systems, to seek electoral advantage or to seek partisan advantage. And the kind of collaborative approach that you know, you're sort of talking about there is hugely important, but it requires everybody who could seek advantage to withhold from attempts to, to gain advantage through this process. Easier said than done, Alfred, I think. This is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. I'm discussing the Wuhan lab leaks theory with my guests Freya Jeffcott and Alfred Moore. In January this year, a World Health Organization team arrived in Wuhan, not before time, according to Maureen Miller of the Columbia Public Health Authority. The team that is there of international scientists, most of them have previously worked with Chinese scientists. So they're well known. They have long standing relationships. The Chinese government has blocked Chinese scientists from communicating with the outside world. Once they're face to face, even virtually through internet while they were there, when they have the ability to communicate, that information gets shared. It's clearly monitored. And China has a lot of explaining to do why they didn't allow this to happen earlier. I'd like to move on to the Chinese context here and, and unpack why the Chinese authorities were so slow to alert the scientific community to the virus, if indeed they were, but that's what I gather, and whether the culture of China is a factor rather than simply the conspiracy theory. Freya, were they slow? To be honest, I can't remember the early sequence of events enough to be able to say whether officials were slow. There was collaboration, though, between Chinese and North American, European, Australian um, and East Asian researchers from very early on. The sequence was re released very early on. There was sort of collaborations. But I mean, that's not unusual. We've seen that even in the Cold War across the Iron Curtain. Researchers tend to stick together, even if there is political division. Help us unpack, Alfred, the impact of conspiracy theories on political theory and, and wider society. It's hard to know what's cause and what's effect. One of the things that people who study conspiracy theories observe is that that term conspiracy theory only emerged in the 1950s. So we might say, projecting backwards into history, oh, you know, the Salem witch trials or, you know, America's accusations against the British before the American Revolution. These look to us like conspiracy theories, but they weren't called conspiracy theories and they weren't understood in those terms in that time. So there's something quite modern about the emergence of this term conspiracy theory, particularly as a term for a kind of tainted knowledge claim or a tainted or disreputable way of making sense of the world. So one of the key things then that we find about this term conspiracy theory that we all use pretty naturally in ordinary language now is that it is a pejorative term that's meant to designate some sort of tainted claim. There are people today who sort of think of conspiracy theories as doing a kind of damage in their own right to democratic politics and that their causes and cures need to be identified. So Cass Sunstein, who's an American legal philosopher wrote a paper in which he, he made exactly that argument. We need to identify the causes and cures of conspiracy theories because you know, they're corroding our politics. But we could look at that the other way around and think of conspiracy theories rather as symptoms of political polarization or symptoms of division. I'm not really sure, but there's something interesting about the fact that conspiracy theory has become a, such a topic of concern right now. So just to say one more brief sort of historical point about that, this is not the first time in which conspiracy language has become incredibly widespread, at least in Western democracies. So in the US, at least back in the 1950s, there was a common you know, fear of communism that led to sort of conspiratorial language across the political spectrum. And also back in the 1890s, conspiracy language, language of politics being rigged or power elites and so on, was a, a fairly cross-partisan, but directed against financial power. So that was sort of in the 1890s. So there may be something interesting going on now that leads to this kind of conspiratorial language across the political spectrum becoming a lot more prominent. I'm not sure if these are related, but the 1950s is when we got a lot of our infrastructure for tackling emerging epidemics. 
And at the time, the way it was sort of fundraised for in the US was leveraging fears of uh, sort of Korean biowarfare efforts. And whilst obviously almost all of the epidemics and pandemics we deal with, if not all of them, are natural, uh, they come from nature, that still very much informed the nature of our systems and our discourse in epidemiology around emerging infectious diseases. And so maybe that has left us a little more predisposed to conspiracy thinking. I mean, that is fascinating because it sort of points to the way in which, you know, science and politics are intertwined at quite deep levels. And that plays out, you know, in some of the cases we think about conspiracy theories emerging. So, for example, AIDS conspiracy theories in South Africa. So there was a French clinician turned anthropologist called Didier Fassin, who's written a number of lovely studies of conspiracy theories around AIDS in South Africa, but he links them precisely to these anxieties about colonial power, about the tying together of development, science, global epidemiology, business interests around medicines production. And those things are all tied together in these theories. So it's, and essentially what he pushes against, and what I think is quite right, is a very narrow sort of framing of what conspiracy theorists are doing wrong, to think of them as people who are foolish or simply malevolent or making mistakes or in need of some sort of correction. Rather, he says, you need to understand that these sorts of suspicions emerge in a context in which there are these histories of colonial abuse and of the use of medicine as a cover for state power. All of these things, you know, sort of swirl together in these kind of cases. So, yeah, I think that's a really nice example. If we assume that conspiracy theory, or if you accept that conspiracy theory is part of human nature to blame somebody else for something that's happened and to emphasize the alleged cover-ups and so on, what do we do about it? Particularly today with communication being so quick, being global, um, that may even engulf us. What tactics should we apply? I think I would say there's one way we should be wary of, and that's the kind of direct pedagogic way, the idea of saying what these people need is to be corrected. And so there is a sort of movement, I should say, or a tendency to want to do increased fact-checking, for example, fact-checking or labelling of claims on social media, which are all sort of structured around this idea that you should go and correct people. And if you correct people's factual beliefs, they would then drop these other sorts of beliefs or connections that they're, they're making. And I think there's some evidence that that doesn't always work. Some people have talked about what they call the backfire effect and found that when people are corrected, they sort of double down on their beliefs. They don't like being told they're wrong. So I think that sort of corrections pedagogic route is often a way we probably shouldn't go. Then I think in terms of structural reforms, a lot of the worry about social media is precisely that it's driven by attention and engagement and that it rewards attention and engagement without regard to the substance of the claims. And so this creates a kind of environment where whatever gets the most engagement and attention is promoted, and it's lucrative for social media companies. So we might think that one way surveillance capitalism, as as it's sometimes called, and the attention economy, that sort of structural route is obviously difficult because dealing with structural problems is hard. And then there's a I guess on a personal or or more individual level, how do you talk to a relative who you suspect is sort of going down the rabbit hole with respect to COVID conspiracy theories? If you have a relative who is worried about the Great Reset, they're not going to take a vaccine. Step one, I think, is to sort of listen respectfully and to find out what people actually believe. And in a way, this is a problem with the very language of conspiracy theory. Obviously, This whole show has been structured around that language and around taking it as though it's obvious for that there are these things that people believe called conspiracy theories. But we also know that it's a pejorative term. We know that it's not something good. And when you're talking to people, if you're sort of using that language of conspiracy theory, if you're casting them as a conspiracy theorist, that immediately might draw down barriers and make them feel defensive. You know, this step one of kind of listening and respectfully engaging to identify hopes and concerns and kinds of fears and, you know, try to sort of talk to people and find out what they actually believe. Because what 
gets stylized in the media as a belief in a conspiracy theory, what might be going on is a little more complex. And a final word to you, Freya. Do you think we will ever find out what happened in Wuhan? It would be nice if we work out the series of events that led to our current predicament. But yeah, I, I'm not going to say for sure that this will happen or that if it does happen, it will happen within the next few years. So I think we're just going to have to redirect our attentions to trying to understand what led to this kind of unchecked spread globally. Really, we need to look at our sort of systems for managing an epidemic once it's begun, whilst we let the sort of slow, fine-grained scientific work of working out the initial series of events take place. Dating back to the Peloponnesian Wars, um, before we even had germ theory and such, there was always an idea that with a human hand, someone was poisoning wells. And I think poisoning wells is, a, is the historical precedent for lab leaks. Well, here endeth Naked Reflections this week. Thank you for listening. And thanks to my guests, Freya Jeffcott and Alfred Moore. If you enjoy this podcast, why not look at our back catalogue of discussions and they're all available for listening. And check out our other podcasts from the Wolf Institute or from our friends at The Naked Scientists. I'll be back next week with some more guests. <laughs>